criticism. Just the word kind of sends chills down my spine. Just hearing that word, I, I, I don't know what it is. Um, even when it's justified, there's just this thing about it. It can hurt, and it can affect how we live, not just now, but for years to come. Just that word, that one phrase, something can, can stick with us, and it can stay with us for a long, long time. I read about how a, a grandpa, Juan, and his 10-year-old grandson, Paco, they were in Argentina, and they were walking home with their donkey, and to get home, they had to walk through five villages. And at first, the grandpa put his grandson on the donkey and while he walked beside. And the people of the first village looked at that and they said, look at that healthy young boy making that old man walk. Look at that, it's just disgusting. And then the grandpa couldn't take the criticism so he switched places with the boy and the boy walked and the grandpa, he rode the donkey. And the next village looked and they came out of their homes and they said, can you take a look at that, a healthy grown man making that little boy walk. What's wrong with that guy? Well, the grandpa couldn't take it, so both got on the donkey. And when they went to the third village, the third village came out and they said, look at that poor donkey. That's, that's animal abuse right there. What are they doing to that poor little animal? How could they? And so both Juan and Paco, they started walking. And as they walked through the fourth village, people came out and they started their criticism saying, look at those two people. Don't they know they have a donkey? They could ride the donkey. What's with them? Finally, Grandpa Juan and Paco, well, they just couldn't take it. So when they arrived to the fifth village, what did they do? The boy walked, Grandpa walked, and they carried the donkey. Criticism. It has ways of changing how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about God, how we feel about everybody else. Whether it's constructive or destructive, it's part of life. You know the difference between constructive criticism and destructive criticism? Well, constructive criticism is when we criticize somebody else. And destructive criticism is when they criticize us. I mean, surely we understand that. It's one thing to give it. It's another thing to take it. And even if criticism boils down to just words, those words can sting. No offense, but they can even hurt more than physical affliction. King David was anointed to be the king over Judah and Israel. He was to be the future king, but it took 10 to 15 years to finally assume the throne. You talk about feeling beat up. My goodness, he had to run away from King Saul. And when King David finally did assume the throne, then his son wanted the throne, and so he kept running. And David finally cried out to God, Hear me, O God, as I voice my complaint. Protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from that noisy crowd of evildoers. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim their words like deadly arrows. Ouch. Ouch. That's sometimes what words can do to us. They're, they're at times like deadly arrows, and I think Satan just likes to whip up the, the noise. Pretty soon we start hearing that noise as we're trying to go to sleep. Have you ever felt like you're under attack? Like who you are is, is not good enough? Or what you're doing isn't appreciated? It's a horrible feeling, and somebody just kind of says something, but then there's a hook to it. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? It's a feeling that's shared by many here in the sanctuary this morning. We've all been criticized. We've all gone through those times when somebody says something and, ouch. But it's also shared by many people in the Bible. You just look through the Word of God. 
I think of the criticism leveled against Moses. Oh, he makes me feel good. I mean, this guy, as he's leading the Israelites, they just let them have it. Every time they get thirsty, every time they get afraid, every time they're hungry, they blame Moses. You think of the criticism leveled against Jeremiah, the prophet. How many times did the Hebrews call him crazy for prophesying that an exile was coming? They would think, well, we're the God's chosen people. Certainly God's not going to do that to us. And they would criticize, and they would take him captive, the poor guy. Think of the criticism leveled against Daniel for remaining true to God while his friends gave in to pagan customs. He stays true but pays the price. And I can't imagine the criticism that was leveled against the Virgin Mary. Imagine what this young woman went through. How could she convince her family and friends that she was about to have a baby, and this baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit? I'm sure family members looked at her and said, right, right. Criticism. It's all over. What about the criticism leveled against the Apostle Paul? It seemed like wherever he preached, wherever he planted a church, people would criticize. He always got in trouble. And even God can't escape criticism. A child in Sunday school class was asked, is there anything that God cannot do? An eight-year-old Michael raised his hand, I know something God can't do. He cannot please everyone. Even God is the object of criticism. And even God is the object of our criticism. Why? What gives? How long? Before we take a look at this, I think we need to define criticism. Criticism is disapproval of someone that is expressed by pointing out faults or shortcomings. It's also a serious examination or judgment of something. So it's a judgment of something or someone in our lives. Criticism, when it's justified and done in the right way, is actually necessary for us to grow. There is such a thing as positive, constructive criticism. We would never improve if people we know and who love us and care about us were not speaking honestly and caring for us enough to speak into our lives to guide us and help us. I don't know about you, but I need spirit-filled, godly people in my life who are honest with me, with whom I can bear my soul and share what's really going on in my heart and life. I need that kind of person in my life, and so do you. Because we need the kind of friends in our lives who love us enough to speak honestly into our lives. And sometimes it's not always just encouragement to go the way we're going. Sometimes it's, darling, you need to get your act together in love. We need people like that in our lives. What we don't need is a criticism that's done in the wrong way, in a condemning way. I don't care how right we think we are, there is no place for being rude and condemning. The wrong kind of judgmentalism in the body of Christ. There's no place for being rude. God doesn't give us that option. He calls us first to love. Love. Love God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. Love God and love others as ourselves. Love. And sometimes love means coming alongside and saying, could we do this a better way? Why do people criticize? What's behind those words? I think people often criticize in order to lift themselves up. Sometimes people just, that's the way they are. The criticism kind of flows from insecurity. Since I can't get up to that level, I'm going to bring people down to mine. People also criticize because maybe there's a conflict inside of them. 
We tend to lash out when we're unhappy with ourselves. A third reason people criticize is maybe it could be that we are guilty of the same thing we're upset about. I used to be very critical of someone, I confess to you. This is somebody I worked with. And then in prayer, God showed me I was guilty of the exact thing that bothered me about that person. Has the Lord ever done that with you? The Holy Spirit reveals, you know what? It's in you. I go, whoa, are you kidding? Really, me? Me? Remember when Jesus told his disciples, he said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? I think we also criticize because we have to say something. We, there's this control thing, and we, we need to make sure things are under control. Maybe we feel, feel that things are, are kind of getting beyond and, and out of control, and somebody's got to do something. And so we feel like our, our preferences may be ignored, and so it's time to speak up. So we approach our opponent face-to-face, -face, or we text, or we email, or do something, or sometimes we even talk to others about the situation. Either way, we have to say what we need to say, what we feel, what's going on, because it's churning inside of us, and we have to let it out, because we care. We care about what's going on, and sometimes we sense we have the right. We have even a responsibility to say what we think. And in the eyes of God, maybe our concerns are valid. Maybe they are justified. Maybe our motives are right, and we need to be heard. That's, that's I pray, there's a community, a spirit of hope and love that people can be honest. And yet, I think God is really concerned about how we express ourselves, how we criticize, and how we receive criticism, what's really going on inside our hearts. The Apostle Paul addresses the issue of criticism in his letter to the Ephesians. Paul loved the church in Ephesus. He stayed in Ephesus for three years, more than in any other city. He loved these new believers. And he, if there's one thing that he wanted for all of these Christians in Ephesus in this area was unity, that these new Christians would be one and that they would love one another because if they could stand together, they could stand up to false teachings and persecution. First, let's do this together. Paul wrote this letter while he himself was in prison. Isn't it amazing? While he is in prison, he can't get out to preach and teach and do the things he wants. Instead of complaining, he's caring about others. What a model for us. And so he writes these words to help believers, not just in Ephesus, but in other new churches all over the Roman Empire to come together and unify in the love of the Lord. We're reading from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 25. Paul says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. And then down to verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This isn't just to that group of early Christians in Ephesus. This is to you and me. Paul is saying that in order to live a life in unity for our Lord Jesus Christ, a life that pleases God, we need to stop some of the old things, those old things that divide us, and start doing the new things that unite us. 
You need to stop the old things that divide and start the new, those new things that unite us. Unity happens as we change from a critical spirit to a Christ-like spirit. It happens. Change begins, and it usually needs to begin in me. In verse 25, Paul says Christians are to stop speaking falsehood. Stop lying or, or, and, and speak truthfully to our neighbors. In verse 29, we're to stop talking unwholesomely. We're to replace our cutting words that tear down with words that build up. In verse 31, we're to get rid of lingering bitterness, rage, anger. You know that stuff that's simmering just below the surface. We're to start being kind. And with his help, you say, well, that's just not me. Oh, yes, it can be. Because we're no longer living for ourselves. We're living with the grace that God gives us, and something changes us. There is a new mercy, a new kindness and goodness. I remember the guys in the newsroom. They saw me as I had given my heart to Christ. Something was changing in me. I couldn't help it. He was bubbling over. I drove him nuts. We need to stop being so critical and mean-spirited and start being more loving and Christ-spirited. And why are we to stop being mean and so judgmental and condemning? Why are we to do this? Because Paul says when we hurt others, we hurt ourselves. You look again at verse 25. Paul says, for we are all members of one body. Now, as members of Christ's body, each person is important. Everybody made in the image of God matters to God and needs to matter to us. And certainly in the body of Christ, everybody matters. Everybody is needed. Everybody needs to be engaged in this mission to reach as many lives and help as many people come to know Jesus. This is an amazing calling. And some of us in the body, we have Christ's eyes. We have the sensitivity to see below the surface. I love the gift of discernment. Some of us have that. We see and we kind of know what's going on. Some of us may be Christ's ears who hear the cries of the hurting and the unsaved. And some of us have that blessed gift of listening. I see that in Diane, my sister. Many of us are Christ's hands who serve and get the job done. We have the gift of helps that, that see and need. They see the need and they just step in. They don't have to be pounded to, to take a part in this. They're just in because they, God has graced them to give, to do something. And Kay and Kathy, you have that gift of helps. And I, I'm so forever thankful for that. Many of us are Christ's feet. And we step into those tough places with the gospel and the grace of God. As Christians, we're all members of Christ's body, and we are connected with each other. When I was battling lupus many years ago, I found out that lupus is what we call an autoimmune disease. Other autoimmune diseases include multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, and some really nasty stuff. And these diseases show up in our immune system. And it's supposed to, our immune system is supposed to fight infection. But what happens when somebody has lupus or this kind of disease, the autoimmune system begins to attack itself, the good parts of the body as well. And in time, our immune system starts shutting down. And I began to think in so many ways that's what criticism the wrong kind of criticism does to the body of Christ. In a similar way, when believers are called to, who are called to fight sin begin to fight themselves, when we fight each other, the church as a whole suffers. And some kind of illness begins to take over. It's an Ill, illness of the soul. It's an illness of the spirit. And the only one who can address that is God himself. 
how we pray together, that God moves in our lives, moves in our marriages, in our families, moves wherever we are, that we carry that reconciling spirit wherever we go because Jesus in us is coming out. Paul says when we hurt each other also, the devil gains ground. The devil can come and divide and conquer. That is his thing. Verse 26 says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Paul says that when we don't speak or behave as we should, we create an opportunity for the devil to go to town. And the devil's typical strategy is to divide us. He begins by dividing our hearts. So instead of giving God our pure, undivided devotion, we pay attention to our pain. We pay attention to those who have hurt us. And we give them more attention than the healing, loving God who wants to take care of us. He divides our hearts, that devil. The devil also divides our relationships, stirring up mistrust misunderstanding and fear and this defensiveness takes over and it blocks God's love and then he divides our homes and churches sometimes over the most trivial thing the devil is the master of division but I don't want to give him too much credit because the fact is we are responsible for our attitudes and behavior the devil doesn't make us do it. An early Christian leader, Victorinus, used to say that we are responsible for what we allow the devil to do in us. You and me, we're responsible for what we allow the devil to do. He doesn't have to gain a foothold. But see, this is what criticism can do. It tills the soil for anger, defensiveness, and bitterness, and it gives the devil the very foothold he wants. So when we're dealing with this resentment or fear or anger, we need to go to the Lord. We need to pray and seek his help because God wants to do something and free us. If God doesn't, Satan not only will have a foothold, but he'll turn that into a stronghold, and that blocks God's love completely. We need Jesus. No matter how long we've known him, we need him more and more. And when we hurt others with cutting criticism, God is also distressed. God is saddened. Paul says in verse 29, do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So when we say things against somebody else, especially against another believer, that, that that thing is unwholesome and disgusting and may not even be the truth, if that undermines a person's reputation, we actually grieve God. This isn't about you or me, but God is watching Remember when Moses' older sister Miriam and when Aaron, his brother, they criticized him? They were all upset because Moses married a Cushite woman. She wasn't an Israelite, so they kind of started talking about Moses. Look who he married. And then they started saying, well, you know what? Why is he so special? God can speak through us as well. And God heard that, and God called Moses, Miriam, and Aaron to a meeting. And I can just imagine what was going on in their minds. I'm sure Miriam probably thought, you know, I have clothes to wash. I'm sorry, I can't make it. Miriam and Aaron met with God, and God told them, I speak to prophets in visions and dreams, but I speak to Moses face to face. He is my faithful servant. Why then are you not afraid to speak against him? In other words, who do you think you are to criticize my anointed? And to make his point, Miriam is overcome with leprosy. It's a horrible thing. She had to stay out of the camp for seven days, 
and eventually she was healed. I always wondered, why didn't anything happen to Aaron, bless his heart? Maybe athlete's foot or boils or something. But nothing, and, and it may be because Miriam maybe was the one who talked more. Who knows? All we know is that God is very serious about criticism and a critical spirit. And Christians are not to let unwholesome talk come out of our mouths. And if we slip from time to time, we need to repent. We need to own it and go to God and say, you know what, I probably shouldn't have said that. Or maybe I could have said that better. And confess this to the Lord. And then as led of the Holy Spirit, go to that person and also confess it as well. When we hurt others, we also ignore God's forgiveness and his example. Verse 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, in God forgave you. And live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. God isn't just asking us to do something that he has not done. He has forgiven us. He is taking care of us, and he's asking us to treat others in the same way. We've seen why a critical spirit and a defensive spirit is dangerous. Now let's talk about how to share our opinions, how to criticize in a way that is constructive and helpful. When giving criticism, and sometimes we're led of God to do so, we need to first check our motive. Will what I have to say benefit those who receive it? Paul in verse 29 says that we are to speak only that which builds others up according to their needs. Is what I am saying addressing their need or is it addressing mine? My need to be right. My need, my preference. My need to be in control here. My need to defend myself. Is what I am saying, what I am about to say, is that to build and help that person? The next thing I, I should do, and maybe in the beginning I need to stop and pray. Does God really want me to say anything? Sometimes the Lord just calls me back to pray, and the more I pray, the more I receive a fresh perception of what really is going on, and maybe I don't have to say anything. Maybe God is calling me to pray. You say, well, I'm just praying. No, prayer is the power to change things. So I'm to pray, I'm to ask God, Lord, is this you? How am I to respond to this? How am I to to speak for you. And Paul also says that if we are led to speak, we should speak the truth in love. Every day, probably every hour, we are tempted to just kind of bend the truth just slightly, just go a little bit off track, just exaggerate just a little bit to get our point across. The Lord here is saying, you don't have to do that. Speak the truth in love. I don't know today, it's harder and harder to understand what truth is. What is truth? Well, because we have the objective truth of God's holy word, we can find the truth in God's word through his Holy Spirit. You want to know how to live? Don't live far from this. Don't live far from God. You will never know what truth is apart from him. He wants to speak that truth into our hearts every single day. May God give us the grace and the truth to speak his truth in love. You know, people today have a hard time knowing truth. More than 10 years ago, the Port Authority of New Jersey wanted to see how many people would falsify their resumes. So they put up a help wanted ad in the paper for electricians with experience using Sontag connectors. Within one day, they received 170 resumes, even though there is no such thing as a Sontag connector. We become so accustomed to stretching the truth. Have you ever caught yourself saying, the check's in the mail, but it's really not? I'll start my diet tomorrow but we really don't. 
I've been praying for you, but we really haven't. I just need one minute of your time when we know that it's probably going to take two or three hours. We've all said things, and maybe we meant them at the time, but we just never quite get around to fulfilling what we say. If someone has done something or said something that merits our constructive criticism, we need, by the grace of God, the leadership of the Holy Spirit to speak the truth not exaggerate, not pull up a long list of prior offenses, but just speak the truth in love. Pastor Jim Burns, this thing stayed with me. For every critical comment we receive, it takes nine affirming comments to even out the negative effects in our life. Can I, let's just live there for a moment. For every critical comment we receive, it takes nine affirming comments to even out the negative effect in our life. How often do I see a child or my grandchild or a friend or whatever, and I have something to say to inform them and help them? But how often am I affirming and thanking them? And God got to me on this one because, boy, do I lift my request to the Lord. But the Holy Spirit told me, daughter, for every request, send up five praises. And my prayer journal has been transformed. I have so many thank yous, one after another, and I see life with this amazing awareness of God's faithfulness. For every request, I lift up five thanks, words of thanks, because I see them at work all the time. And maybe for every word of criticism, may God give us something for which to be thankful. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to us today. And finally, on our way out the door today, when we're criticized, I think you and I, we need to ask who. Consider the source of the opposition. Is my critic trustworthy? Is my critic someone I can trust, a spirit-filled believer or somebody in my life? Or is this person a constant complainer and whiner? Did you ever notice that Jesus responded to different opponents in different ways. His response varied with each opponent, be it the devil, a Pharisee, a scribe, a disciple, or a family member. He responded in different ways. And second, if criticism continues to, to come, we need to ask why. Why? Perhaps our attitude and actions do need to be addressed. Maybe I have a blind spot. I don't even know, but maybe there's something in me that needs to change. And finally, as criticism ends, I need to ask what? What, Lord, have I learned from this? What, Lord, do you want to teach me? Even if my critic is dead wrong, what can I learn in this episode? I think all Christians need to be prepared for resistance. From old friends who liked us the way we were, from family members who are uncomfortable with our faith, from co-workers who test our morals, from bosses who don't appreciate us, and how can we forget? Resistance from devil, the devil, God's greatest enemy. We will always be criticized. It's just the way of life. But how we deal with it really matters. Years ago, in television news, I had incredible experiences that I will always remember, wonderful things, but I also had a few heartbreaks along the way. And I shared this with some of you months ago. Along the way, there was a woman in the news who decided she wanted to move up, and as she moved up, she knew she needed to do something to uh, destroy my credibility, and so she started some lies and rumors about me, and she was doing some very unholy things with her life, and pretty soon, I was demoted and replaced by this person. Now, I was a brand new Christian, and so God told me to pray for her, and boy, did I. Lord God, zap her. 
You know what she said. You know what she's done. Just take care of her. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and as the Holy Spirit does, I was convicted. And the Lord told me to do something very odd. I was to thank him for her. Thank God for this person. What? Now, this is God speaking, because I certainly wouldn't understand it, but I was to thank God for this person. And so I began to thank God, and I, this, I can honestly remember the way I prayed, oh, Lord, please, I thank you for, I couldn't even get out her name. But as I began to pray and thank God, I began to realize that maybe there were things going on in her life I don't know her. I don't know the situation. But I can tell you this. It changed me. And I began to pray for her in a different way. And I, I'd like to say that she came to Christ. She's on the mission field now, and all is going great. I don't know what happened to her. But I can tell you what this did for me. I now understood what grace is about. And sometimes God will call you to do the most unusual, loving thing. And it's only by his grace that he can do this. And sometimes he uses an enemy and somebody who has totally thrashed us to get us to that point where we totally need his help to love. I love differently. I forgive differently because of the people God has placed in my life who have stretched my heart and they didn't even know it. If you're being criticized or if you're feeling led to criticize, stop and ask God, give me help, Lord. Help me to deal with this in a way that will honor you. God, how I need you. Lord, we need you. You know the words that still linger in our spirit. That criticism that may have come years ago. The lies, the misunderstandings that erupted from that. Lord God, oh, forgive me from clinging too long. I want to give that to you, that memory to you, Lord God, that enables me to be free, to love to forgive. I give that memory to you. I give that criticism to you. I give that lie to you, Lord God, because it's weighed me down long enough. Anoint my mind and my lips, Lord God, to know and speak the truth, but to only do so in a way that would honor you and could help and bless someone else. No extra hook, Lord God. May I just speak your word in love. Help us, Lord God, to be careful, to live completely for you, because that's what life is really all about. We need you now more than ever. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have a blessed day in the Lord. God bless you.